Recently, I received a Casio MT240, which was donated to me by Joey Ramirez. He had originally bought it and planned to circuit bend it, never got around to it, so donated to me. But it has some problems. First of all, the original owner had super glued some letters onto the keyboard and even written on the keys themselves with a pen or pencil or something. I have to admit, I've never seen this before. Also, the bells does not work, as you can see. Also, the select button does not work. You should be able to see the light move from here to here, but it doesn't happen. So, I can't access any of these bottom instruments because this button doesn't work. The demo button does not work either. So, as always, I start with a towel to prevent scratching up the top of the keyboard, and I start removing screws. And let's see what's inside of the battery compartment. Arg! why does this always happen to me? And why is there just one battery in there? If they're going to take them out, why not take them all out? Okay, so I got the bottom off. Looks like the battery cable is soldered on. How annoying. In fact, one of the more irritating things about Casio's keyboards is that they solder all of the ribbon cables and everything, which means I'll have to remove all of the boards together, along with the speakers, because they're all soldered on as well. So, I'm going to desolder these wires for the battery compartment, and I think I'll do the speakers too. They're just easy to desolder and it'll make life easier. So, time to lift up the main logic board. It looks like I'll need to unscrew this ground wire before I can get the board lifted out. Unfortunately, I ran into a problem. It just keeps spinning because the plastic stalk underneath has broken off the main case. So, I'll have to use some pliers to hold it while I unscrew. Okay, so I got that out, and here's a close-up of the broken piece. Hopefully I can glue this back on. Okay, so I can finally lift the logic board, and as I suspected, I'll have to remove all of these boards since they're all connected together. So I'll start with this sensor board for the keys. And now to remove the board with all of the buttons on it. I'm curious to get a look at this board so I can see why those buttons are not functioning. I don't know if it will be something I can fix or not. Okay, so here we go. Well, you can see there is some sort of residue on this button. And this is the button for the bells instrument that I mentioned was not working. Honestly, I cannot see why this would stop it from working, but it does look suspicious. So, I'll go ahead and take all these pads off. So, I wanted to remove the key mechanism, but I ran into another problem. These screws don't want to unscrew either. I eventually realized that all of these little stocks are broken off. So, I pulled the key mech off, and sure enough, as you can see, a bunch of these are broken stocks even over on the side. I hope I can fix these. Okay, time to remove the speakers. And these three slider switches. Okay, so you can see this thing is pretty dirty inside. I plan to hit this with the garden sprayer to get it cleaned out. But first, I wanted to see about removing these stupid stickers. I was able to remove some of them with my fingernails, but others were just more stubborn. So I came back with a knife. Now, this is very challenging because it is so easy for that knife to slip and then tear up the surrounding plastic. That's why I'm actually not using a razor knife, because in my experience, those are far more likely to damage the plastic than one like this. There are quite a few of these to remove. I can tell the stickers are coming off, but the super glue residue is going to be a problem. I wish I knew what some kid or some mom was thinking when they super glued those, those letters on there. Instantly, this keyboard was made in 1988, so it would not surprise me if those letters have not been on there for almost 30 years. This is almost like a cruel joke for somebody like me, like they put those things on there just to annoy me on purpose. I mean, if you want to put stickers on your keys, fine, but don't use super glue for God's sake. So, I thought I would try alcohol on the residue. I didn't think it would work, and sure enough, it didn't. It did remove some of the sticker residue, but not the super glue. This part looks like pencil markings. Maybe it would come off? Eh, sort of. I knew that acetone removed the super glue, but it would also melt the plastic, so I'm finding myself in a conundrum here. The last thing I tried was glass cleaner, or as we call it in America, Windex. I decided to put this aside and come back to it later. So the next thing was to rinse all the gunk out as well as the leakage in the battery compartment. 
This is the best way to get those speaker grills cleaned out, so this is another reason I love to do a complete disassembly for cleaning. I used a towel to dry off as much as I could, but I would have to let it set for a few hours to completely dry. On the bright side, the battery compartment looks a lot better now. So now it is time to deal with this broken plastic. I suspect these were broken due to some large external stress on the keyboard, such as sitting a large object on it or maybe during shipping either recently or a long time ago. So the irony is I'm wanting to remove super glue from this part of the keyboard, but I'm going to be using fresh super glue on these plastic stocks. Of course, this is the type of thing that it's actually meant for. Since the brake was uh, sort of lumpy, I had to uh, sort of rotate these in order to find the exact original position they were supposed to be in. So while that glue was setting, I turned my attention to these key sensors. There was some residue on a few of these buttons, but I'm not sure if that's what was causing the problem because I couldn't find any residue on some of the other buttons that didn't work. So I guess we'll see. I also washed the rubber sensor pads off really well in the sink. Uh, they were pretty dusty, however, this one didn't wash off for whatever reason. So I decided to try some alcohol instead. Whatever it was did appear to clean off pretty easily with alcohol. Now it was time to turn my attention to the key mech. This is a typical key mechanism from Casio during this time period. I've worked on several like this. However, after removing the screws, I ran into one odd thing. I could not remove the black keys. I couldn't separate the black and white keys at all. I think they glued them together at the factory, which I have not seen before. So, I guess that's as far as I can disassemble. So, alcohol is my number one first line treatment for stuff like this, and it appeared to work pretty well. I was able to remove this permanent marker residue, and whatever that is. And uh, here's some more of their lovely work. Thank goodness that came off. And eventually I gave the keys a good rinsing in the sink to remove all of the other gunk and crust between the uh, keys. Here is the key mech reassembled, and it appears to have cleaned up really well. So I put the keyboard partially back together and I found the button still did not work. So that goo apparently was not the source of the problem, at least not directly. So I started poking around with my voltmeter trying to figure out where the traces go. What I eventually discovered was this section right here was actually non-conductive now. It has actually been eaten away by some corrosion, possibly as a result of whatever this stuff was on the pads. My guess is it was something probably dropped in there during manufacturing. It probably took years for it to eat its way through those traces. So my plan is to run a jumper wire from here all the way to here. This will get all of the rest of the buttons working, but uh, as for this one right here, I'm going to try to scrape this stuff away and solder directly to it. So I tried several times to scrape this stuff away, but I was never able to get solder to stick to anything here. I think all of the copper was just eaten away, so that button is just simply non-repairable. It's too bad, really, because I really wanted access to those bells and synth instrument. So I did get the jumper wire installed, and uh, I took one of the pads and temporarily placed it on the bank select button and confirmed that it is now working. But I'm not going to stop there. I have another crazy idea. I did a little bit more investigation on the layout and decided to try another little hack that might give me access to that instrument. We'll see if it works once I get everything back together. Okay, so everything's put back together again, and uh, other than the super glue residue, it actually looks pretty good. This keyboard has a very similar case design as the Super Drums keyboards made a year or two earlier, and the keys are identical on them. Anyway, the uh, select button is now working, as you can see. Let me show you what I did. So these four keys were initially broken, and the jumper wire I installed fixed these three. However, it left this one forever broken since I couldn't get solder to stick to it. But it occurred to me that I would never use these buttons here. So I redirected a single wire that ended up duplicating the function of these two buttons on these two buttons. So now I can press the record key to get access to the bells or the synth instrument. Alright, so I'm going to play you a few samples now. Um, do not be fooled by the 210 sound bank. It really only has 20 instruments, but um, I'm not going to play all of them for you, but I am going to play four of my favorite. Uh, the piano, of course, sounds great. I also love the vibraphone.
here's the synth reed. And the synth ensemble. Okay, so what do I think about this keyboard? Well, this one's a little bit conflicting. Now, um, I did an episode recently on the Casio CT380. Now, that was another one that claimed to have 210 instruments, but really only have uh, 20. In fact, it has the exact same 20 and the exact same drum rhythms as this keyboard. In fact, it's almost identical to this keyboard as far as what it can do. Now, the uh, CT380 was a larger keyboard where this is a, a miniature keyboard with uh, many keys, but they both do have the same number of keys. Now, <clears throat> the thing is, I, I told you in the other video that I didn't care for the CT380 too much because I said it was kind of just really boring, but I actually like this one. And the reason I like it has a lot to do with the form factor because uh, it, it does have uh, MIDI ports on the back. And so if you need a uh, retro top keyboard with MIDI that's uh, small, which I like the small ones better, um, they're much easier to collect and they're much easier to sit on your desk and, and play on. And, and I've just kind of gotten used to the little keys. So uh, anyway, uh, in that regard, I actually think this keyboard's pretty cool. Um, so I know that sounds crazy, but, uh, but I actually do like this one. One more thing I wanted to mention is that I've still got this super glue stuck to the keyboard and I have looked at a variety of ways online to possibly remove it. Now, normally if I need to remove super glue, I go with something like acetone, but I know that that would damage the plastics on the keyboard too, because I've tried that in the past and learned my lesson on that. So um, I've read all kinds of other crazy stuff uh, that might remove this super glue. So I'm kind of curious, uh, you can put down in the comments what you think might be a good solution for removing the super glue, other than just trying to mechanically remove it like I was already doing. So anyway, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.